Miss Rock here, and I love story time. Story time is when our speakers share their favorite Bible stories and tell us how they apply to our lives today. This morning we are talking about the story of David's mighty men. Are you ready for story time? Well, good morning and happy Father's Day to everyone out there. How are you guys doing this morning? Pretty, pretty decent, pretty decent, okay. I can tell some, some people are tired, that's okay, it's summer. And for some reason, summer, we're more tired than we are during the rest of the year when we work all the time, but that's cool. That's cool, I get it, I totally get it, because I'm tired. I'm tired because I'm old and I spend a week at the beach with students. So um, I can't keep up anymore, you know? Um, and, and, and they rub it in, you know? They, they're not gentle about it. They're like, ah, you're old, and so it was great. Uh, we had a good time at the beach, though. A lot of great things happened. Uh, just really need to see our kids focused in on God so much. And the discussions that they have and their small group times and when they're, when they're in their huddles, just, it's really neat to see and hear how God's moving their lives. So super excited for that. But being that it's Father's Day, I, I feel I would be remiss if, if I didn't tell a few dad jokes because, I mean, that's what dads do best, right? We, we tell jokes. So um, what, what did the horse say after it tripped? You know, help, I've fallen and I can't giddy up. That, that, that's just, yeah. How, 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 you know, what's red and bad for your teeth? A brick. <clears throat> a brick. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, how, how about, um, what's the difference between a poorly dressed man on a tricycle and a well dressed man on a bicycle? A tire. Yeah, A T T I R E, a tire. Yeah. Uh, hey, one more, one more. Rest in peace, boiling water. You will be a mist. Very, very good. I'll stop there. But uh, trying to lighten you all up there with some humor there. Good. Right. So um, I do want to take a few moments so, to, to recognize our dads and, and to thank them for all they do. So if you're a dad in the room, would you please stand up? Okay. There we go, dads. All right. Good job, dads. All right. Very good. So like, with Mother's Day, they don't stand up because they're reluctant. With dads, they don't stand up quick because they're just sore and old and they have a hard time getting, getting up. I, I totally get it. I am feel that. I was already standing, so I didn't have to worry about that. But no, thank you, dads, for all that you do. You know, and sometimes I think people wonder, like, well, why do we celebrate Father's Day, right? And, and, and most of us think, well, Father's Day is just an afterthought to Mother's Day. And, and they're 100% correct. It is. Father's Day is an afterthought to Mother's Day. Uh, so what happened is... Um, in the early 20th century, after Mother's Day was, was named and implemented, there was a lady in Spokane, Washington, uh, and her name was Sonora Smart Dodd. She was born in Arkansas. Her, her dad was a Civil War veteran who raised six kids by himself. And after she heard about Anna Martha Jarvis's Mother's Day at Central Methodist Episcopal Church in 1909, she was like, hey, we need to do something for fathers too. We need, I didn't have a mom. I had a dad who raised us, so I want to celebrate dads. And so she, she put together this idea. So she got together with a group of ministers in her area. was like, hey, can, on June 5th, can we celebrate Father's Day, make a big deal about fathers. Um, the pastors were like, hey, I think it's a great idea, but we can't do June 5th, because that was her dad's birthday. They were like, it's too quick, we can't get everything put together, but hey, the third Sunday in June, we can do that. And so they picked the third Sunday in June. And initially, it was not successful at all. It, it was a total flop. Um, she, she got to the point where she started enlisting the help of trade groups who made gifts for fathers, like neckties, pipes, um, anything that dads would use. She would be like, hey, can you help promote this idea of a Father's Day? And she ran into resistance because people thought it was gonna become commercialized. Mother's Day had already made an impact financially for a lot of people in the flower industry and stuff, and they thought it was the guy's attempt to make some more money, and you know that is true, but at the same time, there's a deeper purpose behind it. And so there was a lot of resistance. Actually, newspapers at that time would put jokes and satires in making fun of Father's Day for what it was and what it represented. But then, in 1916, President Woodrow Wilson he went to Spokane and spoke at the Father's Day uh, event and wanted to make it official, but Congress resisted it, saying, hey, it's just another commercialization tip. We're not going to do that. The United States Congress said, no, we're not going to do that. So in 1957, 40 years later, a congresswoman from Maine, uh, Senator Margaret Chase Smith, wrote a proposal accusing Congress of demeaning and ignoring fathers for over 40 years while, ignore, while honoring mothers. 
She accused them of just singling out one of our two parents as important in our lives. So 1966, President Lyndon B. Johnson issued the first presidential proclamation honoring fathers, designating the third Sunday in June as Father's Day. And then six years later, that day was made permanent when Richard Nixon, who was president at that time, made it a law and made it a national holiday. So that's what's kind of going on there. So during this sermon series, we've been doing our summer series called Story Time. It's like Dad's Day. It's like, how do I blend those two things together, right? How do I do a Dad's Day sermon using Bible story characters? And actually a lot to choose from. But I chose from one that I thought really would make a difference in this. And we're going to look at today at some manly men, okay, at, at some guys' guys. And that's what our story will be about today. Now, when, when I was 11 years old, uh, we moved from Michigan to Clinton, Mississippi, and the house that we, we got, there was, there was a little pond in the front yard, and there was like a lake across the street. It was kind of cool, and, and you know, we were like, this is awesome. We can go play in this pond, and there was all kinds of turtles and fish we could watch, but there was something else in that pond, and that was snakes, uh, water moccasins to be exact. Now, uh, being from Michigan, we don't have a lot of those up there. Uh, apparently, it's too cold for snakes. They don't like it. And so we didn't have to worry about that. But being here, we didn't know much about snakes. And so we were a little concerned about, how, how, you know, are they poison, venomous or not venomous? Because uh, snakes are not poisonous. They're venomous, okay? Just, just in case. I, somebody would correct me if I didn't say that. So I'm saying it now. And so we uh, were like, okay. So we were out uh, playing soccer one day in the front yard, and we saw this snake. And so we kind of like looked at from distance. And it crawled into the water meter box out by the road. And we're like, oh, that's not good. So uh, my brother ran inside and got my dad. The rest of us kind of stayed to watch, make sure the snake didn't leave. And he told my dad, hey, there's a snake out there. So my dad comes walking out. And we can see from a distance he's carrying stuff with him. Okay? And as he gets closer, we can see that the first thing he had in his hands was an ice scraper. Now, we don't really have ice scrapers here in Georgia, but we have very similar things, like we use them for tile floors. They just call them scrapers or paint scrapers. But, you know, they're basically like a hoe with a straight edge on it, right? Long, sharp, pointy stick, and, you know, about that wide. And so he was carrying that with him. And then we noticed in his back pocket was his pistol. So I guess he figured, hey, if he tries to get away, I'll just shoot it. And then he also had a pamphlet with him. Yes, a pamphlet. It was a pamphlet from the Mississippi Game Commission on Snakes of Mississippi, okay? And so um, we get up there to the water meter. He pops the lid carefully. You, you see the ice pick, kind of drags the snake out. And then he kind of pins the head down onto the dirt. And then he puts the, the handle under his armpit. And he opens the pamphlet. And he starts reading the pamphlet about snakes and trying to identify what kind of snake this is. My dad was like, hey, if it's not a venomous snake, I don't want to kill it, right? So he's doing research on, on the snake. Now, this snake is down here on the ground just like, you know, going crazy, uh, trying to, to bite the handle. And my dad's over reading. It's like, oh, it says venomous snakes. Actually, the fangs fold up into the mouth and they come out when they strike. Oh, yeah, look at that. See, see, look at the, the fangs. They're kind of popping out when you strike it. Isn't that neat? Wow, that, that's a, uh, venomous snakes have a diamond-shaped head, not a round one. Oh, yeah, definitely. A, I'm not a fang. You had me at fang. Hello, you know, but, he, but he's like, you know, reading and everything and Color markings. Oh, that's a water moccasin. Okay, good, good. Yeah. And, and we're like dying over here, you know, as he's like doing this like research. As he's, and this snake is spazzing out. And finally, he's like, yep, this snake has to die. And you just kind of lean down onto the ice scraper and boop, goes ahead. You know, um, <laughs> we're like kind of anticlimactic for all that. But like, okay, it's dead. But I mean, the rest of the year, we, we killed like 20 snakes that year. I mean, my dad would weed eat with the four tin on his shoulder and with the weed eater. It would always be like the last six feet of grass around the pond. And he'd get in there, about six snakes would go out. He would just start, you know, like duck hunt, just shooting them like crazy. Um, we didn't have them the next year because our neighbors, who used to feed all the ducks that come to our pond, bought two domesticated white ducks. Domesticated white ducks have no fear of snakes, just FYI, in case you live in an area like that. And they'll actually attack and eat the snake eggs and kill the snakes. So for the last two years we lived in Mississippi, we had no snakes because they had domesticated white ducks. So if you have that issue, buy you some ducks, Okay. Um, that's just a little side note there. But something about that moment with those snakes, like dad was our hero, you know? Like dad can do anything. Have any of you ever felt that about your dad? Especially when you were younger, not, not your older, you're like, nope, not at all. Yeah, but you know, when you were younger, you're like, dad, dad is like our hero. He can do anything, right? Uh, maybe your dad was in the military or was a first responder and actually is a hero. You know, and you, and you recognize that. But, but maybe your dad was a hero because there was a thunderstorm one night and you were scared and dad came in and comforted you. Or, or maybe, um, and I still get this even from my son, 
there's a bug and I need somebody to come kill that bug. And so, hey, where's dad, you know? And so, yeah, he's six, like 650 feet tall. And he's like, oh, bug, you know? I'm like, great, I'll go kill that bug. Or call your sisters, I don't know. But you know, <laughs> but we get to that situation where it's like, hey, that's okay. His sisters are just as scared. So um, I have to kill all the bugs. And so, you know, that's the situation we get down to. And dad becomes that hero. He becomes larger than life. I mean, elementary school recess, right? You start getting an argument with your buddy over what? Whose dad's the strongest, right? My dad can beat up your dad. And as a dad, you're like, hey, I, well, how did I get pulled into this? Like, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not into this, right? But those are conversations that you had. It's a big deal. We put dads up on this, this shelf of like, they are so awesome. They're heroes. And it's hard for us sometimes to move off of that. And so today, we're gonna look at some guys who took this idea of what meant to be a man very seriously. You know, dads tend to step up, and these guys stepped up. They were guys who made an impact, who made a difference in the world around them. Now, when David Livingstone, he's a missionary pioneer, was working in Africa, some friends wrote to him saying, hey, we would like to send some other men to help you do what you're doing. Are there any roads yet available for us to get there? And this is what Livingston wrote back. If you have men who will only come if they know there's a good road, I don't want them. I want men who will come if there's no road at all. In other words, I need manly men to come down here. I don't need a bunch of sissies wearing stocking caps, driving their little hippie cars coming to me. I, I, I need manly men to step up and say, hey, it doesn't matter if there's a road, we'll make our own road. That's what he's looking for there. And down through the ages, whenever God has done a significant work, he has done it through a band of committed people. They were usually extremely underqualified and would have been the last group of people, people you and I would have picked. But that's how God rolls. God takes these type of people and he builds kingdoms on them. And this was the case when David's kingdom was established. If you remember back in the Bible, there was a King Saul. He was the first king. He disobeyed God, so the kingship was taken from him. God anointed David as a young boy in the shepherd fields, said, hey, you're gonna be the next king. David didn't become king for like 14 years. It's a long wait he had. But during that time, God was doing something in him. He was banished, basically. But David wasn't low. God was with him, but God did something else. He surrounded him with a band of mighty men who, who accomplished great feats of valor. They were committed to David and the kingdom he was gonna have. They were very loyal, very powerful heroes who stood by him and accomplished incredible things in combat. Stuff modern soldiers couldn't do. Shoot, stuff fictitious soldiers couldn't do. Last night, Ben and I were watching the... Uh, the Hobbit, the Battle of the Five Armies. And um, Legolas, if any of you are familiar with Lord of the Rings or that, Legolas is this elf warrior who is like really good. In one battle in the Lord of the Rings, he kills 42 orcs by himself. Like these are not things that people normally do. That's, it's pretty big deal. But we're gonna read about a guy today in a few minutes who killed 800 men by himself in one day. And these were the men that surrounded David. Second Samuel, you'll find it, chapter 23, start with verse eight. It says, these are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Joshua Bahapath, the Tachmite, chief among the captains. He was called Adino the Esnite because he had killed 800 men at one time. And next to him among the three mighty men was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, son of Ahuhi. He was with David when they defied the Philistines when they were gathered there for battle and the men of Israel withdrew. He rose and struck down the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clung to the sword. And the Lord brought about a great victory that day and the men returned after him only to strip the slain. And next to him was Shammah, the son of Agri, the Herite. The Philistines gathered together at Lehi where there was a plot of ground full of lentils and the men fled from the Philistines. But he took his stand in the midst of the plot and defended it and struck down the Philistines and the Lord worked a great victory. And three of the 30 chief men went down and came upon harvest time, David at the cave of Adullam, when a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. David was there in the stronghold and the garrison of the Philistines was there at Bethlehem. And David said longingly, oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem that is by the gate. Then the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and carried and brought it to David. But he would not drink of it. He poured it out to the Lord as an offering. And he said, far be it from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Shall I drink the blood of the men who went the risk of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. These things the three mighty men did. Now Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zariah, was chief of the 30, and he wielded his spear against 300 men and killed them and won a name beside the three. 
He was the most renowned of the 30 and became their commander, but he did not attain to the three. And Benaniah, the son of Jehoiada, was a valiant man of Casbio, a doer of great deeds. He struck down two aerials of Moab, which are, which are giants, two giants of Moab. He also went down and struck down a lion in the pit on a day when snow had fallen. And he struck down an Egyptian, a handsome man. The Egyptian had a spear in his hand, but Benaniah went down to him with a staff and snatched the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. These things did Benaniah, the son of Jehodia, and won a name beside the three mighty men. He was renowned among the 30, but he did not attain to the three, and David sent him over his bodyguard. This is an incredible listing of a group of men, and there's, there's more men to talk about. Heralded for their value, valor and skill in battle, David's mighty men were a unique group of fighting men who came to David after he fled from King Saul. You see, David had gone from a family shepherd to a giant slayer when he killed Goliath. He then became a military commander for Saul, and then he became a hunted criminal because Saul tried to kill him. And David had a new task. Once again, he became a shepherd, but not to sheep. He became a shepherd to men of Israel, who are some of them even from outside of Israel. The author of the book of Samuel tells us that in addition to David's brothers and fathers joining him, in 1 Samuel 22, 2, we see this. And everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him. And he became commander over them. And they were with him about 400 men. So some of these men, again, were David's family, but others fought alongside him in the army and they heard what happened to him and they rallied to him after that fact. Many more were just mercenaries, outsiders to Israel. They were criminals. Alone, they were known as notorious killers. But together, when they became one of the land's most feared and effective fighting forces, proving themselves loyal to David the rest of his life. You see, if God is going to accomplish a great work among us, he's going to raise up a band of mighty men among us. The New Testament makes it very clear that God desires men to be the spiritual leadership at home and in the church. The church today, our church, needs a band of mighty men like these who surrounded David. So what characterizes these men and sets them apart, right? Although each of David's 37 mighty men had their own skills, their own talents, their own abilities. One's noted as being super fast. You have these guys who killed hundreds of people. They all share some common characteristics. They all share some things that are common and essential. And I think things that we should glean from them and put in our lives today. If we want to be mighty men for God, if we want to be mighty people for God, all of us should kind of put these attributes into our life. And the first one is this, mighty men display courage. If you look back at the first one there, these are the names of the mighty men, right? He had Joseph Behev, the Tushbite, chief among the captains. He was called Adonai the Esnite because he had killed 800 men at one time. Adonai is called the one who sits in the seat. He was the chief. He was the commander of the, 30, of the mighty men. He won that honor that day he killed 800 guys by himself. Look, a feat like that takes courage. To stand there. I mean, you know, we play football in America today, Right? What would it be like if your quarterback lined up and the other 10 players decided they weren't going to be there that day? They ran away because the other team looked mean. And he was like, that's fine. I'll play them by myself. More so, what if, what if they said, hey, bring other people on the field too? Now there's 800 people on the field. He's like, no problem. I still got it. That takes courage. And that is what he had. He had this courage. Now, we need to understand that word. We need to understand what courage is because there's a big misconception about courage, okay? Courage is not the absence of fear in our lives because if fear is not present, guess what we don't need? Courage. Courage occurs because there is fear and courage is a way that you respond to fear. You see, courage is actually a value assessment. When we talk about courage, this is what courage is. Courage is me looking at a situation that requires, that has fear in it. And me saying, hey, I see this fear in front of me. But what's beyond that fear, there's a value of what's beyond that fear is more important to me than the fear itself. And so I'm going to go through that fear to get what's on the other side. Okay? Real simple. If, if my kids were in a yard and there's a mean dog between me and my kids... I value my kids, which is on the other side of that fear. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going through that dog. I'm going to attack it with my bare hands to get to my kids. 
And that might be an extreme point, but that's what any kind of courage is. Hey, what's on the other side of what I fear has great value to me. And because of that value, I'm willing to go through that fear to get to that. This is important that you understand. Because if what's on the other side of fear doesn't have value, then it's not worth going after. If what's on the other side of that fear isn't valuable to you and you still go through it, that's not courage, that's stupidity. That's recklessness. Courage means, hey, there's something worth doing something for. And Adam and I, he saw that. He, he was like, hey, we have to protect our nation. And there's fear in front of me in the tune of 800 men. To be honest, there were probably more than 800 men. The rest probably ran away after they realized this dude just killed 800 of us by himself. I'm not next. And they started to flee. But he realized what was beyond that was important to him. So he said, I'm going through that. Serving the king requires courage that others lack. You see, courage stays in the fight because the fight is worth it. And that kind of courage will always overwhelm your enemy and they can't stand up to it. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus, then you have to have courage. We're promised in scripture that we'll be attacked by the enemy. We're promised in, scr in scripture if we follow after Jesus, things are gonna happen to us. And it takes courage to get through those things. So you need that courage, you need that courage to walk through to follow after God appropriately. And after courage, the next trait we see is this, is that mighty men develop constancy. Okay, 2 Samuel, the next part of verse nine, it says, and next to him among the three mighty men was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, son of Ohihi. He was a David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle, and the men of Israel withdrew. He rose and struck down the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clung to the sword, and the Lord brought about a great victory that day, and they returned after him to strip the slain. I, I want you to picture this. There's this mighty battle going on, and everybody retreats. They run away. And, and, and Eliezer says, I'm staying. I'm not retreating. I'm staying, and I'm fighting this battle. He fought so hard that his hand stuck to his sword. I've had this happen in my life, not, not fighting hundreds of people by myself. But I was land surveying in Florida. We were cutting through the swamps, and it was a really thick swamp. I held that machete for probably four hours that day, just hacking through things. And when I went to go back to the truck to put the machete down, I went to the tailgate, I did this, and nothing happened. I couldn't open my hand. The, the muscle memory had struck to, the, to that. The, my coworker had to come and flip my hand over. He pried my fingers open so I could pull the machete out from my hand. And then my hand closed right back up. It was like a uh, half hour drive home. And my my fans, hand slowly over that time began to open up slowly. And so this dude fought so long that day that his hand just stuck to his sword. He couldn't take the sword out of his hand. It's a long time with a lot of stuff happening. Listen, he had constancy when other people fled. They turned the tide so much so that they came back to, to, they said, get the goods from the slain. Now, what is constancy? It's not where we use it every day, right? Constancy is the quality of being faithful and dependable. Serving the king requires perseverance when others quit. Look at, there is a huge lack of staying power in the modern man. Huge lack of staying power. Think of how many homes you know that don't have a dad in them. United States Census Bureau shows that nearly 18.5 million children grow up without their fathers in America. This has brought about um, the title for the United States, the world's leader in fatherlessness. That is, that is not something that America needs to be number one in. But it's where we are. You see, we need mighty men of God who are dependable and faithful to their families. We, we need mighty men of God who are faithful and dependable to their wives. We need mighty men and women of God who stand together and say, hey, we're not leaving this. And we need mighty men who are faithful and dependable when it comes to being at church, and leading at church, and leading at home, to have that staying power that are faithful and dependable. The next characteristic we see in these mighty men is this, is a demonstrated commitment. We see in verse 11, it picks up, and next him was Shema, the son of Agri the Herite. The Philistines gathered together at Lehi, where there was a plot of ground full of lentils. And the men fled from the Philistines. But he took his stand in the midst of the plot and defended it and struck down the Philistines. And the Lord worked a great victory. He was committed to protecting something. He said, hey, this is our food source. And I'm not going to let the enemy have it. So I'm going to stand in this field and anybody from the Philistines that comes here, I'm going to kill him. And that's exactly what he did. He had commitment. 
He said as long as he needed to stay, he did what was ever required of him. He was committed to doing what he said he would do. And the Bible says that God used him to bring about a great victory. Serving the king and being a mighty man calls for commitment above and beyond what others do. Rick Warren once said this. He said, nothing shapes your life more than the commitments you choose to make. See, all of us are committed. The question is, what are we committed to? Are we committed to things that honor God or are we committed to things that honor us? Where does that commitment lie for us? Following after Jesus is something we do for the rest of our lives. It's not a Sunday morning event. It's an every day, every hour, every minute lifestyle that we choose to live. We need mighty men who are men of integrity, who do what's right because it's the right thing to do, not because it's a popular thing to do, who are committed to following after Jesus all the time because that's what God called us to do. We need men committed to the cause of Christ, who are showing the world around them and their kids what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It's not giving in, it's staying the course. That's commitment. The last trait we see in these mighty men is that the delight in a challenge. Pick up in verse 13. It said, and three of the 30 chief men went down and came upon harvest time to David at the cave of Adullam, when a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. David was then in the stronghold and the garrison of the Philistines was then at Bethlehem. And David said longly, oh, that someone would give me a water to drink for the well of Bethlehem that is by the gate. So then the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines and drew water out of the wells to Bethlehem that was by the gate and carried and brought it to David. But he would not drink of it. He poured it out to the Lord and said, for be it from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Shall I drink the blood of the men who went down and risked their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. These things the three mighty men did. Look at these three guys were sitting at camp. They were near David because they were his mighty men. And David just, you know, talking to buddies and probably having dinner, he goes, you know what's really good? I mean, th- this water we're drinking is okay, but you know what's really good? Down in Bethlehem by the gate, there's this well. It's a little bit deeper than all the other wells. The water's just cold, it's clear. It's some of the best water I've had in my life. Man, I- I'd love to have that water again sometime. And these three guys were like, we can make that happen. So they snuck off and no one was around. They snuck through the enemy lines. They went to the well and drew up water. I just think about this. We don't read scripture right. There's an army there, which means there's people watching a gate. There's a well there. Drawing water from a well is not a quiet thing. You don't turn on the spigot. You're letting a rope down with a bucket. You're pulling it back up. They're splashing, they're sloshing, there's metal creaking sounds. All these noises, which meant they were probably killing some people along the way. But they got the water for David and they took it back to him. Say, hey, you remember earlier? When you were like, oh, I'd love to have some water. Guess what? Here you go. Now, he wouldn't drink it because the risk they took. He wanted them to know how much he valued them. Listen, we need to be challenged in our lives. To follow Christ means we're going to face challenges. You see, in mighty men, revel in the challenge. They don't wait for somebody else to go before them and make it easy. They, they, they don't wait for someone to say, hey, go now. They're like, hey, we're in, 100%. We're, we're doing this. David's wish was their command. He didn't tell somebody to go get me water. He just simply said, man, that would be great. They're like, I can make that happen. When you're driving down the road and someone's stuck on the side and God says, maybe you should stop, and you drive by, is that a challenge? Are we listening to what God's saying? Are we hearing those things to say, hey, I'm gonna step out and do that? When you're at work and that coworker walks by and you're like, I don't know if they go to church anywhere. Do you stop and ask them? You're like, I will. Maybe one day I'll find out. It's a challenge. Do you revel in the challenge? Do you revel in the fact that, hey, this not might pay off for me, this may not work, but it's a challenge and I'm gonna do it anyway. Because it's out there in front of me. You see, there's a question for us today. Are we more interested in challenges or comfort? Frank Peretti once said this, comfort can be a dangerous thing. You stick around home all the time where it's safe and nothing ever changes. And before you know it, you get set in your ways and you quit learning, you quit changing, you don't grow anymore. If you're following after God, it requires growth all the time. Comfort doesn't cut it. 
I guarantee you, a cross of wood with three nails in his arms and, and legs wasn't comfortable. I guarantee you being whipped beyond recognition of a man wasn't comfortable. It was a challenge he accepted because he loved us so much. Many of the things that we do in our lives aren't comfortable. They're a challenge. Are you ready to take those challenges? Are you ready to step out and say, hey, you know what? I'm not satisfied with just being this way. There's people all around me who don't know about Jesus. I'm gonna take that challenge and I'm gonna be the one to tell them. I'm gonna be the one to step out. I'm gonna live my life in such a way that they may think I'm a goody two shoes, but they're gonna see something different about who I am. And when hard times come, they're gonna see something different about how I handle that. And I'll take that challenge because the cross of, cross of Christ is worth it for me. And I'll gladly take that challenge any day. You see, we see today that these mighty men did not run from a fight. They actually ran towards it. They invited it. They saw victory where others saw defeat. And they seized opportunities that others hesitated or cowered in fear to do. David's mighty men weren't large in number, but their courage, loyalty, and willingness to stand their ground, jump into snowy pits, kill lions, and challenge giants were enough to win the day each time. Never underestimate how much a small but committed group of people can achieve when their focus is on God. You see, even though David fled the palace of King Saul, frightened and alone, he wasn't gonna remain alone forever. God provided the help he needed. He surrounded him with these mighty men. And listen, these mighty men were strong in what they did, but because they hung around David, who had a heart, a man who was man after God's own heart, you know what David did in return for them? He gave them purpose to their lives. He showed them who God was. And so while they physically protected him, David spiritually impacted these men. Look at, as we often see what happens in life, that mighty men become even mightier when they're surrounded by other mighty men. We need people in our lives who encourage us. We need people in our lives who challenge us, who spur us on to say, hey, you're getting comfortable. I need you to step out. Hey, you're falling back. I need you to go forward. We need other men to say, hey, you know what? I don't like the way you talk to your wife and kids. And I can't stop you at home, but if you're around me, you're not gonna talk to your wife and kids that way. Because guys, if you're like me at all, and you're around other people, you see it. And I ain't perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But I know when things are right and wrong. That's what mighty men do. You step in, say, hey, we're not, we're not doing that. Hey, we're gonna go this way. Hey, my family's going to church and I'm taking them. That's what mighty men do. You see, these mighty men's lives were forever changed by God. And are you ready today to let God change your life and do something completely different? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I, I want to thank you so much for the fathers in this room. God, I want to thank you that you model what fatherhood is. God, fatherhood is, is making hard choices. Fatherhood is loving no matter what. Fatherhood is leading. God, I pray for each of these dads in this room today. God, empower them. Strengthen them. But God, not in their physical strength, but God, in your strength. God, I pray for humility, for meekness. God, for power under control. God, let them lead well, let them love well. God, let their families cherish the fact that they have them as fathers. God, I pray today that if there's anyone in this room who doesn't have a relationship with you, that today they would. God, all of us have such a long way to go. 
But God, let today be a day that we take a change. God, that we accept the challenge. God, that we can become more committed to you. God, that we have that constancy where we stay no matter what else. That we're faithful and dependable in our relationship to you and to our families. And God, give us courage to look the world in the eye and say, I don't care what you think. I know what God says, and that's what I'm going to do. Thank you so much for loving us. God, your name we pray these things. Amen. Amen.